If anybody wants money, I will give it to them and they can carry it and then August the 15th, Mike will be speaking. And September the 5th is the Gideon Sunday. And September 24th and the 25th is Rabbit Day. The Kingdom King Kids Cracks and Ice Cream will be on Saturday. And on Sunday there will be special music with Ron's message also. And we will be taking a love gift up that day. Right, Mary? The week before. The week, the week oh, before. The week before. We will be taking a love gift off. And we have the wise card, so if anybody wants a wise card, see Mary. She's the only one here today. And Operation Christmas Child for the shoe boxes, tablets, pencils, pencil sharpeners, and crayons. And people celebrating the birthdays in, at Country Comfort, Assisted Living, Sandra Hoff, and Darlene Mansfield. Does anybody else have anything to add <coughs> any announcements? I did say welcome to all our visitors over there in the corner behind Anna. <laughs> They're family. <laughs> well, a long time visiting. <laughs> but we're glad to see you. So, if there's nothing else, Pastor Ritter said he would take over from here, right? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Pastor Jim Ritter. I don't even have to read the scripture. Good to see all of you here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <laughs> it's been a while since I was here. And especially for those who, who were not here the last time, or for those who um, are kind of new. The vest that I'm wearing this morning comes from Northern Thailand, from classmates of mine that um, I went to school with in seminary. They served for 20 years in Northern Thailand with a tribal people called the Akha. And the ladies there do both machine stitching and also hand stitching. So it's a combination almost of uh, machine quilting and kind of cross stitch. Um, but they're very fond of colors like this, and uh, um, my friends got me this. And uh, Chuck, the, uh, the husband of the group, said, Now, Jim, you need to understand something. I said, What's that? He said, You need to understand that in Northern Thailand, this is a triple X. <laughs> <laughs> and what size do you wear, Chuck? <laughs> Chuck is six foot four, and he wears a triple X too. <laughs> so, um, it's good to be with you this morning. Let's turn our attention to the Lord. Would you please take your hymnals and turn to number 518, the responsive reading 518, Trusting in the Lord. Let's stand together. Rejoice! The Lord is here. He loves us, forgives us, and wants to set us free of care. We come to worship you, Lord, and experience your peace, which releases us from the burden of cares, so that we care profoundly about your eyes and our lives and the people who need your love through us. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Lord, we need he that above all else. else. Hear, Hear our minds, think, think your thoughts through them. Hear, Hear our wills, ready to be guided to do your will. Hear our emotions, Open to receive and express your love. Here are our lives. Make us carefree, but not careless. Responsive to you, so that we can be responsible and be your faithful disciples. May this time of worship heal our worries, so that we can be free 
to live the truly joyful lives in the power of the indwelling Christ. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number sixty is number five eighteen. I'm sorry, sixty-four. We have come into his house, number sixty-four. Father, we thank you for being with us this past week. You were always there. You were always faithful. You never left us alone, even if we didn't sense your presence sometimes. We thank you and praise you for that. Father, today is, on the one hand, it's the end of the old week, but it's also the start of a new one. And it's good and it's right that we're here at the conclusion of the one and the start of the other. Father, we don't know what all is going to happen this coming week. We kind of suspect from past experience that some of it will be good and some of it may be bad. Some of it will bring laughter and some of it will bring tears. Some things we'll understand and other things we'll be confused by. But in all of it, you will be there with us. You promised to do that and you've never lied. So Father, in faith, we will go forward into this new week with the assurance that you'll never leave us alone. Father, we're thankful today for the gift of your son Jesus who died on a cross in our place so that we might be forgiven and become the children of God. We pray today that we would realize once again how great your love is and how great your mercy is toward us. You didn't have to do it. You chose to do it freely. Father, you've heard the needs and concerns in our hearts today. You know all about us. You know the things that worry us and keep us awake at night. 
You know the things that make us feel sad and lonely and confused. You know the temptations that we face. You know what we've said and done and the things that we're ashamed about. And Father, we confess before you today that sometimes, sometimes our biggest sin is that we think we're so much better than what we really are. Meet us today at the point of our needs. Forgive us, please, of our sins. But don't stop there. By your Spirit, make us different. Make us more like the Lord Jesus. It's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen. Well, the scripture reading is that I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that um, until the next part because I'm going to read that just before the message. Um, so we're going to move on to the next hymn, which is number 424, Day by Day. Number 424, Day by Day. And if you would, please stand. <laughs> different English words, not, not terribly different from each other. They're related, 
but they're called nuances. They give, they give a different, rich shade of meaning with each one. So if what I'm reading doesn't exactly match what you're reading, that's why. If you want to think, if you want to think of it that I am reading from the Ritter Amplified version this morning, <laughs> um, that, that will work, okay? Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 40. This is Jesus addressing his disciples. Be prepared, dressed, and ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Be like servants who are waiting, and not just waiting, but ready for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that whenever he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready and watching for his arrival. They will be rewarded. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve and have them all sit at the table, and he will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching and ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. They will be rewarded. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a thief was coming, he would not allow his house to be broken into. He would be prepared and ready. In the same way, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Okay. The title of this message is waiting for God. Now, the focus of the passage that I just read is on the return, it's on the second coming of Christ. And I think most of us maybe already understand that. The emphasis of the passage is that Christians are to be prepared and ready for his return. We're to be ready for the coming of Jesus. That's the point of the passage. But recently, I've been in contact with a number of people who are waiting for God in regards to some personal situation that they have. Okay, they're waiting, yes. But they're waiting for something that's going on in their lives that's personal. They're waiting for God to move and act and work. Usually, usually it's, a, it's a situation that's a long-term kind of thing. Uh, some longing or need that they have, some kind of personal request. And they're looking to God and they're waiting for Him to move and work and act in that situation, either in their own life or in the life of somebody that they care about a great deal. But they're waiting. And maybe some of us here today are like that. And, uh, huh. Maybe you've noticed Waiting is not an easy thing to do sometimes, okay? okay? I read the story about a church secretary. She walked into the pastor's office, and she finds him pacing back and forth and back and forth in front of his desk. He looks like a caged lion, and he's just going back and forth, and there's an intense expression on his face. And this is out of character for him. He's usually a very calm, very sedate kind of guy. Not today. And she looks at him and she says, My gosh, what is it? What's wrong? The pastor stops pacing. And he looks at her and he says, What's wrong is that I'm in a hurry and God isn't. <laughs> Show of hands. How many of you can identify with that? Yeah, me too. So maybe a sermon on waiting is kind of a practical thing for us today. Now, here's the question. <clears throat> How do we do this? How do we wait for God? What, what should our outlook be? What should our attitudes be <clears throat> during our time of waiting? Waiting waiting for an answer to prayer, 
We're waiting, as the passage says, for the coming of Christ. What should our attitude be? I'm going to suggest four different attitudes, okay? Four outlooks that Christians should have. Now, before I do that, let me explain something. The thing about attitudes is this. They are not automatic. They are not autom automatic. Attitudes require work, okay? Please understand this because some people think that an attitude is an automatic kind of thing. No, wrong, it's not. Attitudes require work. They require deliberate, active choosing and then cultivation on our part. The development of an attitude takes both of those things. Choosing to have a certain attitude, a certain outlook, and then cultivate that attitude, that outlook. So what I'm saying is this, attitudes require energy. They require the energy of our minds and of our hearts. So please understand this before we start. Attitudes are not automatic. They are not. They require the energy of our minds and hearts. We choose to have a certain attitude, a certain outlook, and then we cultivate that day by day by day. All right. When it comes to waiting for God, the first attitude, and <laughs> tell me you did not know this was coming. The first attitude is patience. I know. Don't you love it? Like I said, you knew that word was coming. You know what the hardest part about waiting is? You know what the hardest part is? The waiting. <laughs> uh-huh. Because waiting involves time. And we don't know how long we're going to have to wait. We don't know when the waiting will be over. If it's over in a short period of time, we like that. But if we've got to wait a while, we can get impatient and we can get frustrated. And we don't like that. I had a pastor share with me the following story. This is, this is great. <coughs> he says, I was in a store the other day, and the person in front of me wanted to leave, but her receipt was slow coming out of the cash register. And she starts making motions with her hands, right? She starts making motions with her hands, trying to speed up the printing of the receipt. Now you've seen this, you may have done this, okay? And it's going on and on and on like this is the receipt that had to have been CDS. <laughs> had to have been CDS. And he says, as I watched her, I was amused until I realized how many times I've done the very same thing. I become impatient, waiting for the printer to print, the coffee to brew, and the street light to change. Ouch. He says we live in this culture of convenience and instant gratification. And he says we have lost the art of waiting. I'm told that people in Russia may have to wait in line for hours just for a loaf of bread. People in places like Afghanistan might wait weeks. For us, we get irritated if the line in McDonald's isn't moving fast enough. Let, let's be honest because we're in church. <laughs> I think he's right. You know, if you've read the Bible, you know this. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. That's how it's referred to. It's, it's a quality that God wants us to develop. Now the thing is, we get agitated, we get impatient if things don't happen as immediately or as fast as what we think they should. But can we talk? The truth of the matter is this. The truth of the matter is 
If we don't have to wait, we're not going to develop patience. And I know. I hate it too. But it's true. Second way we wait is with trust. We wait trustingly. In other words, we believe and we trust that our God is faithful and he will fulfill his promises to us. Now, this applies not just to our personal lives, but also going back to the scripture reading, it applies to the second coming of Christ. Let me share with you a story. Not long before his death, Christian writer Henri Nouwen, he was a Frenchman, he wrote a book called Sabbatical Journeys. And in this book, he wrote about some of his friends who were trapeze artists. It was, a, it was a family type of thing. They were called the Flying Rudellas. They told now that there's a very, very special relationship between the flyer and the catcher on the trapeze. And that relationship is governed by very important rules, such as, this is going to sound simplistic, but it's not when it's a trapeze artist. <coughs> the flyer is the one who flies. The catcher is the one who catches. I know, that sounds simplistic. It's not when you're 30 feet in the air. <laughs> the flyer is the one who lets go. The catcher is the one who catches. As the flyer swings out on the trapeze, high above the crowd, the moment comes when he must let go, and he flings his body out into midair. His job is to keep flying and wait for the strong hands of the catcher to catch him at just the right moment. One of the flying regalas told now, the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. The flyer's job is to wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch him, but the flyer must wait and trust. Now from that story, from that interview, Nowen writes the following. Waiting is a period of learning to trust. Waiting is not a static state of being. It is a time when God is working behind the scenes or invisibly and in us, and the primary focus of his work is in us. His goal is to develop the strength of our faith, our trust in Him. His goal is to develop the strength of our faith and trust in Him during our time of waiting. So, God, during waiting time, is at work in us, creating growing his life and his character in us. And we must wait for this to become bigger and more developed than what it is now. We have to wait for it to come to full term. It's just like it is with patience. If we don't have to wait, we're not going to become patient. If we don't have to wait, the level of our strength, the level of our faith, our trust is not going to develop. We have to trust both God's timing and His way of doing things. Now that's an easy thing to say. It is not an easy thing to live. The third way we wait is with a sense of expectation. Okay? Expectation. We wait with expectancy. God is at work. God is at work, either invisibly in that situation, or he is at work in us, or a combination of both. Now, <clears throat> let me share with you a story about waiting with expectation. This is a rather dated story, but I think the point that it makes will be, will be very clear to you. 
This involves back in the old days when the telegraph machine was used. Now, if there's anybody here who doesn't remember that, we're talking Morse code days, okay? Think about the old westerns, especially the old black and white ones with the clickety-clack machine that the heroes always managed to wind up in that office somehow for something. So we're talking about those days, all right? So this story comes from those times. Author Gary Preston tells this story. It's in his book, Character Forged in Conflict. Here's what he writes. Back when the telegraph and Morse code was the fastest means of long-distance communication, there was a young man who applied for a job as a Morse code operator. He answered an ad that had been in the newspaper, went to the address that was listed. When he arrived, he entered a large, noisy office, all kinds of things going on. And in the background, of course, there's this telegraph machine that's clicking, clacking away. There's a sign on the receptionist counter. And the sign instructs job applicants to fill out a form and wait until they were summoned by the manager to enter his office. The young man completed his form, and he went over, and he sat down with seven other waiting applicants. So he's number eight. He's the last one. Seven other people before him. But after a few minutes, the young man stood up, crossed the room to the door of the manager's office, and he walked right in. And all the other guys are starting to look at each other, and they're saying, what is going on here? Why has this man been so bold? And then they start talking among themselves, all right? They start muttering and grumbling among themselves. What, why has he done this? Why, what, where, who does he think he is? We didn't hear any sons yet. And they're going back and forth like this among each other. And they took smug satisfaction in assuming that the young man who went into the office would be reprimanded for his presumption and thrown out and disqualified for the job. Within a few minutes, the young man emerged from the inner office, escorted by the interviewer. The manager announced to the other applicants, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, but the job has been filled by this young man. Well, now they really start talking to each other, and they really start grumbling. And finally, one of them pipes up and says, wait, 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 wait a minute here. I don't understand. He was the last one to come in. We never even got a chance to be interviewed, but he gets the job? That's not right. That's not fair. The manager said this, all the time that you've been hit, that you have been sitting here, that telegraph machine in the background has been clicking out the following message in Morse code. If you can understand this message, come right on in, the job is yours. <laughs> and then the manager said this, none of the rest of you were listening for it. None of the rest of you were expecting it. He was. And so he gets the job. You see, he didn't get the job just because he was waiting. Everybody was waiting. He was waiting just a little bit differently from everybody else. He was waiting with expectancy. Now, when it comes to waiting, whether it be for the second coming of Christ or whether it be for our personal prayer requests, there's a sense in which we are all in the waiting room, all of us. But that story shows us that it is how we wait that's the important thing. The young man, he wasn't just waiting. He wasn't just passive. He was actively listening. He was actively looking. He was expecting something's going to happen. And it did. And because that was his attitude, he got rewarded. So the lesson here for us is this. Waiting is not just sitting around, twiddling our thumbs, 
being passive, doing nothing, according to the story and according to Scripture, we need to be watching and expecting and looking for God to fulfill His promise. So how do we wait? Do we wait with a sense of expectancy? Or is that maybe something that all of us need to work on? I know it is for my life. The fourth way in which we are to wait for God is being faithful. We wait faithfully. Patience, trust, expectancy, faithfulness. Now to be faithful means this. To be faithful means that we're doing like what the service did in the scripture reading. We are doing what the Master wants during our waiting time, we are doing what the Master wants us to be doing. We are being ready for His appearing. It is an active kind of thing. It is not a passive kind of thing. <clears throat> Let me put it this way. It is a commitment of love and loyalty to Jesus Christ that results in actions. That's what waiting faithfully means. A commitment of love and loyalty to Jesus that results in actions. You could also put it this way. It's waiting in obedience. It's waiting in obedience to what we know. Waiting in obedience. Let me share this story. You may know the name Gordon MacDonald. He's a Christian author, wrote a number of books that are very worth reading. Gordon MacDonald writes about an experience that he had in high school. He says, Running track in my prep school days taught me a very valuable lesson. I was at the Pennsylvania Relays, a famous Eastern track meet. Our relay team was going to run in the championship race. I was the leadoff man, and I was in the second lane. Well, the man in the first lane held the 100 meter dash record for prep school runners. In other words, he fast. He also held a record for arrogance. When I got to the line and we were putting our starting blocks down, he said, well, may the best man win. I'll be waiting for you at the finish line. We went into the box. The gun sounded. He took off, and the other seven of us settled in behind him. We, were, we went around the first turn and down the back stretch. About 180 meters into the race, I suddenly saw the record holder in front of me holding his side, bent over, and groaning as he jogged along. And we all passed him like we were standing still. Because I'm such a gentleman, I waited for him at the finish line. <laughs> After that, my coach took me aside and said this, I really hope that you learned something today. It doesn't mean much if you hold the record for the 100 meter dash when the race is 400 meters long. You know the race that you and I are in called life? The race that we're in is a long one. And it calls for endurance. It doesn't call for speed. It calls for endurance. It's not how you start the race, it's how you finish that counts. Listen, this story, when Gordon McDonald was running that race, he, he finished well. Why? I'll tell you why. He finished well because he was a trained distance runner and he was obedient to his training. That's why he finished well, because he was obedient and faithful to his training. Same is true for you and me. Being faithful and obedient to the stuff we already know we need to be doing. You know, when it comes to waiting, 
Some of us, we're in situations that are long term. And we need that quality of endurance too. I believe this. I believe that when it comes to waiting, that the Lord wants us to cultivate these attitudes of patience and trust and expectation and faithfulness, being obedient to what we know we're supposed to be doing. So let's believe today that God will do that in our lives. And let's cooperate with His Spirit and the development of those qualities. Now let me close with this. It may be that you're here and um, maybe it's not so much that you're waiting for God, maybe God's waiting for you to either make a commitment of faith and trust in Jesus Christ or to rededicate yourself to Jesus and maybe rededicate yourself to those cultivation of attitudes that we've talked about today. I want us to pray about that now. Would you bow your heads? Lord Jesus, if there is somebody today who needs to make that faith commitment, I ask that you would draw them to yourself, that you would reassure them that you've done everything that's needed for them to be forgiven and become a child of God. Father, for those who are believers, we would pray that by your Holy Spirit and by our listening to you, that these qualities, these attitudes of patience and trust and expecting and faithful obedience, that you would build these things into our lives. And we ask all of these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Make it happen. Amen. Closing in this morning is hymn number 452, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Hymn 452.
to draw other people to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you.